And it looks like I misspelled the default values. I'll fix that. And there we go. We're done. So let's look at the code that actually went into this application. So it's very similar to applications that you've uh, looked at before. Uh, you create a map, create your base map layer, tile map service layer, add that to the map. And then I'm going to create three feature layers. Each one of those layers I saw in that template picker, I want to create that feature layer uh, and set up how the features are going to be retrieved. Add those layers to the my map. And when all of the layers have been added, it's going to fire this function, init editor. And this is all the code that I have to do to actually get that editor to come to life. I give it the div where it needs to go. Um, I pass in the map, a reference to a geometry service instance, and the layers that I actually want to edit. And then that's it. You have an editing application right out of the box. But let's look at how those templates actually show up in the service. So just like you would, to build great base maps, you would author the, author the map in ArcMap, and you would spend a lot of time uh, um, tweaking the cartography, you want to do the same thing when you're deploying applications that, need to be, that are going to edit data in your database. So you want to define what the users can actually enter. And that's template-based editing. So if I look at one of these layers, like evacuation perimeter, and organize the feature templates, and look at the properties of one of these. These are the templates that I can that the that will be exposed in the service, and then all of the clients will consume. So I can set the default value for this template. I can pick the default drawing style, how I want the uh, uh, editing widgets to draw the features, and I can change the symbol. Now, if we look and see how that was actually exposed um, at, in a service. We'll go to the services directory. So this is the feature service for this uh, sheep fire service. I see all of the layers that, uh, that I can uh, work with. Uh, I can drill into one of the layers, like the points of interest. I'll see information about the drawing info, so the renderer is now coming back and can be consumed by all the clients. And I see all of the templates that users can actually create which contains their default value. This is the information that the web clients use to build these editing widgets, or editing applications, excuse me. Well, now let's look at uh, a more focused application. Oops, wrong one. So what we're looking at here is an example of a type of application you might, you might build. This is a customer service uh, portal for the citizens of Naperville, Illinois. They can see all of the service requests that have been entered uh, from existing users. So I can uh, touch one of these. I see that someone's uh, requested graffiti removal at that location. Uh, I can see the, the picture or the feature that was, the image that was attached to that feature. Uh, and I also can see the comments or the trail. I can go ahead and add my own comment and rate it. Please clean this and submit that, because it's by my house. And that's added into their system. They can use that information to create work orders and go and fix it. I can also create uh, new features by just clicking on the map. So if I click over here, it's going to uh, give me the ability to add a new service request. I'm going to say I want a pothole, big pothole. I can give my name. This is all configurable, however you want to expose it. Email address. And I have the ability to attach things to this, to this feature. In this case, I want to tax, attach a picture. Here's the pothole I want to attach. And I can submit that request. So it's been submitted within the geodatabase, and I can go back and pick it up later. Uh, if I click on that, I'll see the attachment, the big pothole that I just added, and it's now within the database. Um, now let's take a quick look at the code for how this application was actually built. just want to drill into a few of the key points. So you saw me um, uh, look at attachments. Attachments are a new concept with ArcGIS Server 10. You can uh, attach any file, so a zip file, a PDF, an image, a movie, to a feature. You can attach multiple things to that feature. So this, is, this function right here is going to see all of the attachments that have been added for that uh, feature. So I pass in the request feature. 
I'll ask the feature to give me its layer, and I'll check and see if that layer has attachments. I'll then use that information in that layer to query for attachment infos, passing in the uh, object ID for that feature. If any of them come back, I can then display them within that web, uh, within that web content pane. Oops. Lost myself here. Ah, IDE. When in doubt, oops, wrong one. <laughs> Sorry, bear with me. I'm not. I'm not like John Cocken, So. Uh, uh, Okay, I'm almost done, Sud. Good old view source here. All right, uh, so we just looked at that one. The last two more things I just want to point out really quickly. Um, how do I know that there's comments on that feature? So again, this function takes in the feature. Uh, and the other thing that's exposed at 10 is the ability to query the geodatabase relationships. For, so for a particular feature, I can find all of the related records for that feature. So here I'm setting up that query. I'm going to call on the layer query related features, pass in that relationship query, and then print the results out. Finally, we saw uh, how the user submitted their own comment. So when I entered my own comment in, um, in this case, I create the record, I set the attributes. This comment is actually, so this is a related table to that feature. It happens to be a standalone table. So here I'm using uh, the client technologies to update standalone tables uh, that are exposed to the GeoDatabase. On that table, I'll call apply edits, pass in my new record, and then I'm done. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. So you can see that. Thank you. So at 10, Basically, the geodatabase becomes a web geodatabase, and it's exposed all the way out to the browser by the services server and its REST APIs. And you can build applications that access features, that access relationships, that access attachments. So it's very powerful. You can build very powerful editing applications. Next, we'd like to talk about time. And Bjorn uh, from the server and web teams is going to help us do that. Thank you, Sud. Time isn't new in ArcGIS 10, but it's become a lot easier to use. GS data has had a temporal data for a long time. Uh, whether you're tracking hurricane paths or mapping wildfires or visualizing la historic land use. In ArcGIS 10, time has been enabled through the whole stack, from ArcGIS desktop to ArcGIS server and down to the web clients. By enabling time and publishing the time-aware layers, and using the new out-of-the-box time slider components, an application like this is really easy to create. What we have is here is yet another example of earthquakes. And here we're showing earthquakes from 1970 to 2010. When I'm starting the, the, to play here, what you're seeing is it keeps adding more earthquakes for those years. And the older earthquakes are being aged away into a more transparent color. So how is this possible? Well. It all starts with ArcGIS Desktop. In ArcGIS Desktop, under your layer properties, there's a new tab called Time. And the key aspect here is that you enable Time, and you specify the field you want to use, and then you're ready to, to use it. Using our, once we publish our service, and up the font, we can see that this layer now has a Time Info. It specifies that the date we specif the field we were going to use and the time extend from 1970 to 2009. Since this is now available in the REST API in the service directory, the web APIs can use this automatically. Lost the thread. So now let's look at the code. Here I'm using Flash Builder 4, which was released two days ago by Adobe. The first step of getting the time in your web APIs is to add your class, in this case, my time slider. It's very straightforward. The second part 
is to set, on the time slide, I want to set the time extent. In this case, I had a layer that was going from 1970 to 2010. When the layer has been loaded, I have this metadata available, and I can set the time window on my time slider using this really long property name. <laughs> 